There are three ways in which we can represent a quadratic function. We have standard form, vertex form, and factored form. We know that each of them has an x and a y variable in them, an independent and dependent variable. We can also see that each of the three forms has the variable a. a does the same thing in each one of them. It controls the direction of opening as well as how wide or narrow that parabola is. We know that c in standard form is the y-intercept. We know that h is the x-coordinate of the vertex, and k is the y-coordinate of the vertex in vertex form. In factored form, we can see that we have the variables r and s. To see what r and s do, let's go ahead and put some numerical values in here. My a value is going to just be 1 in this case. So we're going to go into y equals, and we're going to type that function. My window is just the standard window, going from negative 10 to positive 10 on both the x and y axes. And you can see that on each of those, my scale is 1. And so when we graph this, we can see that we have a y-intercept down here. We could figure out the value of that. We also see that we have an x-intercept at negative 2, and we have a y-intercept at positive 5. And this makes sense because we know that x-intercepts occur when y is equal to 0. So if we were to substitute in a 0 for that y variable there, we can go ahead and see that what would make this factor equal to 0 is if we put a negative 2 in for x. What would make this factor 0 is if we were to put a positive 5 in for x. So we can see that r is our first x-intercept, and because it's a minus r, that means we have an x-intercept here of negative 2. Minus a negative makes that positive sign. And here we can see that our other x-intercept, s, is going to be that 5. So we have x-intercepts at r and s in factored form. So anytime you see factored form, we know that the r is our one x-intercept. We know that the s is the other x-intercept. If we have no x-intercepts, we cannot write the function in factored form. a is the same as standard form. So if a is positive, our parabola opens up. If a is negative, our parabola opens down. And it also determines how wide or narrow that parabola is. You're also going to see the x-intercepts referred to sometimes as the zeros, the roots, or the solutions, depending on what the exact context is. All of them essentially mean the same thing. So when given a function and asked to determine some characteristics of it, you can always enter this into your calculator and then use your calculator to get those x-intercepts, y-intercept, etc., as we did in a previous lesson, or you can recognize it's in factored form. We know automatically these are going to be the x-intercepts. And one little clue is that the sign is always going to be the opposite of what we see here. So the first x-intercept is going to be a positive 3, and the next intercept is going to be a negative 4. So you can also think of this as x minus negative 4. When you multiply those signs together, we get that positive. So because the factored form is written in x minus r, x minus s, it's always is going to be the opposite sign of what you see in the brackets there. Our y-intercept, and again, you can get this off your calculator, but we know that a y-intercept will occur when x is equal to 0. So if we substitute a 0 in the place of those x's in that function, we can go ahead and work out the value of each bracket and then multiply together. So negative 3 times 4 is negative 12, times 2 is negative 24. So we have a y-intercept at 0 and negative 24. And that will always occur in factored form. So if x is equal to 0, basically that is 0 and that is 0. A quick way of generating it is just to multiply the a value times the r value times the s value. That's going to give you that y-intercept. So 2 times negative 3 is negative 6 times 4 is negative 24. The axis of symmetry is going to occur halfway between any two points on that parabola that have the same y-coordinate. So we're looking for what is the average distance between 3 and negative 4. So you can always go ahead and average those together. 3 plus negative 4 is negative 1. So we have an axis of symmetry that vertical line passing through the x-axis at negative one-half, and I know that because my a value here is positive, the parabola is going to be opening up. All right, so you can go ahead and graph this, always to double check to make sure that we're right. When you enter this, just make sure you press a minus, so that's the operation key here on the right-hand column, not the negative, so it's going to be x minus 3. And then I still kept my window as just the default settings, and let's take a look at the graph. So again, you can use your calculator to get those values, but because my scale is 1, I can see negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. One of those x-intercepts is indeed negative 4. The other one is going to be 1, 2, positive 3. My y-intercept is at negative 24, so we'd have to adjust the window, and then we can always go second function trace, 
Number one lets us enter any value for x. We know the y-intercept occurs when x is zero, and sometimes your calculator is able to get that value. The axis of symmetry, so that's going to be crossing the x-axis at negative one-half. So you can kind of look and see, is that equal distance to that intercept as well as to that x-intercept? And the parabola, and you might have to actually adjust the window. So if I go down to the y minimum, let's maybe put in, so negative 30, and then I'll maybe do a scale of five here on the y-axis. So when I do that we can see that there we go so our vertex is over here and our y-intercept is going to be there the parabola is indeed opening up because it opens up we know we're going to have a minimum and we need to get the value of that so that's going to be the y-coordinate of the vertex you can again graph it on the calculator get that y-coordinate of the vertex or we know that the x-coordinate of the vertex is going to lie on that axis of symmetry so something else you can do is to take this function and substitute in if it's lying on that axis of symmetry we can put Put that negative one half, that negative 0 0.5 into that function in the place of x. And then when we go ahead and work out each bracket, so negative 0 0.5, negative one half minus three is going to bring us down to that negative 3.5. And negative 0 0.5 plus four is going to bring us up to that positive 3.5. When you multiply those three values together, we end up with a y coordinate of the vertex at negative 24.5 which then makes it really easy just to state the coordinates of that vertex. So we know the X coordinate comes from where that axis of symmetry is. We know that Y coordinate is going to be the minimum in this case value. And then it is a good idea to grab your graphing calculator and just take a look at it. Make sure that we have the axis of symmetry dividing that parabola in half and then quickly just make sure that the distance from that axis of symmetry is equal to each of those x-intercepts. Make sure that the vertex also looks like the coordinates are in the correct location. You can verify those precise measurements by using your graphing calculator. We can see that each of these functions is written in standard form. So right away we know in standard form that c value is our y-intercept. So we know the y-intercepts, but we are asked to determine the zeros. Zeros, remember, is another way of saying what are those x-intercepts. So we could graph this and use our calculator, but as you've already discovered, it is really time consuming to get the zeros on your graphing calculator. But if we are able to factor this and to turn it into factored form, we can quickly grab them that way. All right, so when we go to factor, so Last year in grade 10, you factored a lot of polynomials. So if we take off this y equals, you would have been given something like this and been expected to factor it. So it's the same process. We're just going to keep that as a function. Start with the greatest common factor. So is there a number or variable that divides evenly into each of those three terms? And we can see that there is. So we're going to divide each term by four. And remember, factoring, we are creating brackets. So if we were to distribute this in again, that's going to eliminate the brackets. We would get back to what we started with. We can see that we have a trinomial within the brackets and so with a trinomial we know that we are going to multiply the a value by that c value and when we multiply those one times negative six is negative six so we're looking for two numbers that multiply to negative six and add to that b value of positive one if there are two numbers that fit those two pieces of criteria this polynomial is factorable so there are we know three and negative two are those numbers and remember those are always the outside and inside product when we FOIL. So we can go ahead and set up our two binomials and when we go to factor this, however you learn to factor, go with that method. I'm going to reverse FOIL this so I know that the first terms multiplied together have to get me back to that x squared. So I'm going to put an x and an x and then I know that I've got a 1 here. This times that last number has to give me one of those two numbers. So it doesn't matter what you happen to put in. I put the negative 2 in first and then this 1x times 3 has to give me that other number there and the last term is a check so three times negative two is negative six I'll link the factoring videos below if you need to go back and review your factoring and then once we have it into that factored form we can see that one of those x-intercepts is going to be at negative three one of those x-intercepts is going to be at positive two so it's always the sign that's opposite from what we see in that bracket let's try this next one here so again if we go to put this from standard form into factored form is there a greatest common factor so we can see that there is not 13 is a prime number so because it's a trinomial again we're going to multiply that a value and that c value together and 2 times 15 is going to give us 30 so we're looking for two numbers that multiply to 30 and add to that b value of 13 so what two numbers multiply to 30 and add to 13 and so that's going to be 10 
and three, and then we can go ahead and set up our two binomials. So remember, this number times this number has to multiply to give us that 2x squared. So we can go ahead and put in here, so 2x times x will give us 2x squared. And then we're going to say 2 times what number is going to give us one of those numbers. 2, there is no whole number we can multiply 2 by to get 3. So we're going to have to go with this one. So we know that 2 times 5 is going to give us that 10 when we multiply those together. And then the inside product, 1 times what is going to give us that other number. And we know that 1 times 3 is 3. And your last term is a check. So 3 times 5 is 15. And again, you can quickly check. So we've got 2x squared and then 10x plus 3x gives us 13x, 3 times 5 gives us 15. Now this does not quite look like factored form because here we just have that 1x and the 1x. Here all of a sudden we have a 2. So I know that the x-intercept here is going to be negative 5, but in this particular case we're going to do something a little bit different here. I know that x-intercepts occur when y is equal to 0. So if I were to take this factor and set it equal to 0, we can get that x-intercept that way. So to get that 0, that x-intercept, Let's take this factor, set it equal to 0, and then we have a linear equation we can solve. So let's subtract 3 from each side to isolate that 2x term. And then to isolate the x, we're going to divide out that coefficient of 2, giving us negative 3 halves. So if you were to substitute in here 2 times negative 3 halves plus 3, this has a value of 0. That is where an x-intercept occurs. And then we can do the same thing here. x plus 5 equals 0. And then if you were to move that 5 over, we can see that negative 5 is our other x-intercept. And then with our last example here, we can see that there is a greatest common factor of 2. So we can go ahead and pull that out. And then if you multiply a1 times c4, 1 times 4, are there two numbers that multiply to 4 and add to that b value of 3? And there aren't. Let's go ahead. I'm going to graph the original function just to make sure I didn't make a mistake factoring. Let's take a look at the graph to see what happens here. And in this particular case, we can see that there are no x-intercepts. The vertex is above the x-axis and it's opening up. So this particular function happens to have no x-intercepts because of where that vertex lies and because of the direction of opening. Now that's not always the case. There are going to be quadratic functions that do not factor that do have x-intercepts. They just happen to be irrational numbers. So in an upcoming lesson, we'll look at how to approach those ones. But generally speaking, if we have something in factored form here and we can factor it, we we can really quickly identify what are the x-intercepts there. If there is a coefficient other than 1 in front of that x, then we can set this factor equal to 0 and solve for that 0 or that x-intercept. And if something doesn't factor, at this point check the graph to see are there x-intercepts. In this particular case, this last function here just happens to have none. And in our final question here, we are asked to write an equation in factored form or to write the function in factored form. And we are told that that function has x-intercepts at negative 3 and positive 2. So going back to what we did previously, we can see that if we have an x-intercept at negative 3, it goes into the bracket as x plus 3. If we have an x-intercept of positive 2, it goes into that bracket as x minus 2. So we know the values of r and s in factored form, but we still need to figure out what that a value is. Similar to what we did in the previous lesson, we're told that we have a point at 1, 8. So I know that 8 is the value of the y coordinate. So we can substitute that in for y. And then 1 is the value of the x coordinate. So we can substitute that in for x. And then we have one variable a that we can go ahead and solve. So if we work out this bracket, 1 plus 3 is 4. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And then we can multiply multiply this side. So negative 1 times 4 is negative 4 times a is that negative 4a. So if I want to isolate this a, I'm going to get rid of that negative 4 coefficient by dividing out the negative 4. And then we can see negative 4 divided by negative 4 is 1a. And then 8 divided by negative 4 is negative 2. And so then we can put that value of a back into the place of the a. And we now have that particular function written in factored form. And you can always go ahead and graph this on your graphing calculator and then check when x is a value of 1, is y going to equal 8 to see if that point does lie on this particular parabola.